Okay, is it working? Let's see. Oh. Yeah. How's it working, guys? How's it doing? This is the best I can do, friends. Sorry about that. This is why I got to find my own place. You got to pray for me because I was going to live stream inside, but. I had to go outside to do it. I can't do it inside. So I guys pray in Jesus name. I find a place sooner than later uh, because I'm here with my oldest brother. It's home. So I have to be sensitive to their hours. So I thought the house was going to be empty right now, but it wasn't. Sister-in-law came in, so I have to be outside. But is the sound quality good? Sound quality good? Before I move on, picture maybe not the best, but hopefully by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, the internet connection will stay strong in Jesus' name. Pray for that because I'm outdoors. I'm here in this nice sunny area and pray that the picture isn't too bad. The picture is good enough that it's tolerable, right? Get my muscles back in Jesus' name. So everyone all right? Let's see. Thank you, Fat. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you for your kind words. All glory to the triune God. All glory to the Father. All glory to the Son, the Lord Jesus. All glory to the Holy Spirit. Anything good that comes from me is because of the grace of the triune God. The only thing I contribute is my imperfections, my impatience, my anger. Right? Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Yahweh. Yes, how you, Sam? I don't know what you mean, how you, Sam. How am I Sam? Because Jesus made me Sam Shimon. So what do you mean, how are you Sam, Serena? How, how am I Sam? Because Jesus made me Sam. I mean, do you want me to be David Wood? I don't know what you're asking me. Right. Good. Yeah, Vish, it'll be better if you just listen and not see my face. As long as the sound quality is good. The picture, the resolution may not be the best, but hey, we have to tolerate until by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, I find a place. So are you praying for that? God will provide abundantly for my daily needs and provide through me to take care of my my daughters my precious angels the lord jesus restore them to me and find a place within a month because my uncle when i say younger he's older than me but he's younger than my oldest brother he's coming we're going to be living together in the meantime so pray for that right father we love you lord jesus we love you holy spirit we love you father i know you don't need me we need you we depend on you and it's an honor a grace a blessing to be set apart by your spirit, to be used to glorify Jesus Christ. So, Father, please, for the sake of your people, bless the internet connection, keep it strong. Bless this time, destroy all distractions of Satan. Surround us with the wall of fire from your Holy Spirit. Cover us with the blood of Jesus. Purify us in the blood of the Lord Jesus, your beloved Son, your heart, who became flesh for us, for our redemption, Father. Please, Father, anoint the words of my mouth. Save me from stammering from confusion, from error, enable me to recall the passages and interpret them correctly by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. And open our minds, our eyes to see the depth, the beauty, the majesty of your word, the Holy Scriptures. And use these sessions, Father, to produce greater love and passion and faithfulness, to love you more perfectly, to trust you more perfectly, to to hope in you more perfectly and live for you more perfectly, conforming to the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and seal us by the Spirit, Father. And again, I pray for our loved ones who are not here. In my case, my daughters. Cover them with the blood of Jesus. Purify them with the blood of Jesus. Shield them with your Holy Spirit. Fill them with your love and your peace and your joy. And reunite us, Father, sooner than later in Jesus' name. And save us from our child. Save me from a corrupt legal system. And plant me here solidly and to be used mightily. Not just on the internet, but locally to glorify Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father. We love you. We love you, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit. Anoint this session and have your way. And Holy Spirit, fill my lungs, my chest, and throat with the health I need to glorify Christ. Here will be done and have your way in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name.
father, Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know, I had a brother. Sorry about that. I had a brother in Christ whom I don't really care for much, and I've gone after him and gone at him in comment section, especially Muslim blogs. That was actually making fun of me for praying. It tells you what kind of low life he can be. Even though he's a brother, he can still be a low life trash and the Lord Jesus have mercy on him and have mercy on me and forgive us and help us to love each other making fun saying oh he prays like it's some magical incantation the typical American Christian you know I'm sorry about that I don't mean to vent may God heal my heart transform me transform all of us and crucify our flesh and mortify our flesh and save us from the stain of our flesh and forgive us when we fail and fill us with life and power and fruit from the Spirit in Jesus name right anyway with that said, I'm changing gears for this talk because I was asked my view about Luke 16, verses 19 to 31. Luke 16, verses 19 to 30, 31. Sai Christian, what's up, bro? Love you, man. Good good to see you online. We'll see each other face to face sooner than later in Jesus' name. And the Lord fight for you and purify you and keep you <clears throat> washed in the blood of Jesus and transform you to become more like Jesus and I pray that for all of us. Yeah, Allah, Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. Anyway, sorry about the resolution. I'm outside, so the internet may not be as strong, but as long as the sound is good. If the sound is good, I'll keep pursuing it, proceeding. Right? Sound is good? Sounds good, right? Maybe it's good that the picture is not too good because I don't want the sisters to start drooling, right? Don't worry, I'll get there. I haven't in, been in gym, but I'm still eating good. I'm still losing with weight. I don't want sisters to start doing saying, what a gorgeous, handsome Christian apologist. He doesn't need to apologize. And I'll just sit at his feet and learn all this. <laughs> I, I, got, I got issues, you know. I got issues, seriously. Oh, man. Honestly, before I begin the discussion, you have to have a sense of humor. You really have to have a sense of humor to cope with the stuff that Satan and the world hurl at you. Sahih Christian knows my situation. I know his situation. I am testimony. Sahih Christian can tell you. I am testimony that Jesus Christ is God Almighty. And he's all almighty to save because had it not for Jesus Christ, had it not been for Jesus Christ, the things that were hurled at me by Satan using human instruments, I should have lost my testimony, and I would have lost my testimony and probably been in prison had it not been for Jesus Christ, God Almighty, who loves us, preserving me, right? And so some of the stuff I've seen, yeah, even, even Sai Christian, both of us, right? Some of the stuff I've seen, wow, you got to have a sense of humor and you have to laugh. And again, I'm not trying to get in the pity party and feel sorry for me because God forbid I ever feel sorry for myself because there are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ right now as we speak who are being tortured, who've been in prison for 20 years, who are being beaten, starved, some even being violated, raped, murdered, and they stand tall till the end because of the Holy Spirit filling them. Shame on me if I complain about my, my minuscule problems. Lord Jesus, forgive me. I don't mean to complain. So I just... I'm just saying, you know, the Lord is more real than we can imagine. And the Lord really has brought me through a lot. And he'll continue to bring me through this for his glory. Well, one thing I, I desire that happens sooner than later. One thing I desire that happens sooner than later. Just to hold my children again. Kiss them, love them, affirm them, and raise them up. Pray for that miracle. Because I, I'll, I'm going to share some with you from my heart. I know people hate me. And. You even have some nasty, filthy dogs pretending to be Christian saying, see, this is God's judgment on you, disciplining you for being a jerk, right? But I have not seen my daughters since June. I have not seen them since June. I have not held them since June. I have not kissed them since June. And I haven't put them to bed, sleep for two years. And my youngest, my baby girl, her birthday was October 26th, and I wasn't there earth on earth I don't love anyone more than I love my daughters right 
I love God more than anything. I love God more than them in Jesus' name. But on earth, I don't love anyone more than my daughters. And I ache for them. Yeah. Today was kind of hard, too, because uh, I went to a soccer game. My niece's children, my oldest brother, his, his daughter, she's in her 30s. She's married. She's got three kids. And I was at the soccer stadium watching her kids, you know. You know, they're around seven, five, three, right, around that age. And I left because I was thinking about my daughters. Today is Saturday, and I'm wondering who's watching them because their mother works. Where are they? Where are they at? And are they thinking of me and wondering where I'm at? Yep, King of Kings, you said it perfectly. Some days are harder than others, and boy, today is very hard for me. You know, I had to fight back tears. Right. And again, I promise you, I'm not saying this for you to feel sorry for me, but I'm opening my heart because we are family. You who are regulars who keep coming to my live stream, you know who you are. And I know who you are. We are family. I know you love me for the sake of Jesus. And so I can be open with you. So you know that I'm not a Superman. I'm not. I'm not a Superman. I am absolutely nothing. I'm absolutely nothing. Nothing without Jesus. And I cannot stand without Jesus. I will fail miserably unless Jesus, my God, my love, my Lord, my life saves me. And I mean that. And I mean that. So if you love me for the sake of the Lord, do not stop praying for my angels. The oldest is Sariah. The youngest is Zipporah. Bathe them in prayer that the Lord will remind them of his love. And he'll protect them recklessly from any damage, irreparable damage. And remind them that their earthly Baba loves them more than they'll know, right? Anyway, yeah, Sariah means princess of Yahovah, princess of Yeshua, Jesus, and Zipporah, because that was Moses' wife. Anyway, with that said, I'm changing gears because I was asked, I was asked to discuss Luke 16, 1931. So guys, there's going to be a lot of meat. Pray for the internet connection in Jesus' name. I got a lot of meat to unpack. And one thing I want to introduce you guys, I love all you guys. Uh, you know, we have a gentleman named Vine who's been really blessing me. Vine 101. He's, he was an ex-Catholic monk who actually teaches theology and has gone to seminary. And yet, God in his grace and mercy has used me to bless him and help him see things in Scripture that he hasn't seen. And that humbles me. That blows me away because here I am, no formal education, just trusting the Holy Spirit to fill me. Teaching someone who lived a celibate monastic life for 10 years. And he's being blessed by someone like me. What an amazing God and how humbling. Thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Sound good? Sound still good? Everything good? Vine, I pray in Jesus' name, the Spirit keeps filling me to serve you, Vine, and bless you till I die. Uh, now, someone just asked me a question. I noticed my topic is about the rich man and Lazarus, and someone asked me a question about how do I answer Muslims. Samson, Tishom, you know what you say? When that Muslims ask you about God regretting, saying he regrets the fact that you asked that question, Samson. And he regrets the fact that you asked me a question not related to my topic, tempting me to block you. But I'm going to forgive you for that mistake, right? I hope the birds don't don't bother you, Carm, because remember, birds can be a sign of angelic envoys. So don't hate, Carm. Repent. Face these. Okay, let's begin. All right. Don't worry. If he keeps sp spamming, I'm going to send him on his merry way. Send him back to Asheron. All right. As long as the sound is good, and in Jesus' name, we don't buffer. I don't care about my picture because it's better. It's blurry, so the sisters here don't fall in love with me. Because if I were you, I would I would be fighting myself from falling in love with someone that looks like me. All right. Okay. Let's stick on the topic. Luke 16, 19, 31. I was asked, is this a parable or is Jesus describing an actual situation that takes place in the afterlife? Okay. Let me, let me repeat the question. Is this a parable or is Jesus describing an actual situation that takes place in the afterlife? Either or. It's both. Right. Sorry about that. Let's wait. I'm like a bird. Oh, by the way, it's both. Who said it's either or? 
the assumption is if it's a parable, then it's not actual. And if it's actual, it's not a parable. This is a gross misunderstanding of how parables work. If you actually study the parables of our Lord Jesus, the parables are based on everyday actual events and real life situations, right? And uh, When a sower goes and, and sows, well, that happens, right? So in other words, don't assume that if it's parabolic, don't assume that if it's parabolic, then that means it's not actual because parables are illustrations from everyday life activities that people engage in every day, right? So don't assume if it's a parable, it's not based on actual everyday life experiences, right? Clear? Let's see if I, if I get it closer, would it be better? I don't know. Let's see. Maybe if I bring it closer, sorry. I'm trying, guys. Someone's telling me to get closer to Waleed, why don't you do this? Why don't you send me a blank check instead of complaining? Send me a blank check so I can go buy a condominium and have my own place so I can have my own internet connection that I can get on anytime I want. If you don't want to send me a blank check, stop complaining and be thankful that I'm even able to get on. Okay, Walid? I can tell you the address to send me that blank check. Be a doer and not just a complainer. Okay. Is it a little better now? A little better? All right. Let's begin. I'm going to demonstrate Luke 16, verses 19 to 31, is based based on an actual encounter that takes place in the afterlife. Because, number one, I have no reason to assume it's not an actual encounter that takes place with Abraham, Lazarus, and the rich man. There's nothing in the context that suggests otherwise. That's the first thing, as the Lord Jesus anoints me to speak clearly for his glory. Number two, this is one of the only times in which Jesus actually gives names to the characters within the parable. And one of the names we know is actually historical, Abraham, right? In all other parables, right, does Jesus identify the names of the persons in the parable? There's one parable in which when he explains it, he shows that the characters in the parable stand in place of him, Satan, and the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of darkness. But in this particular parable, he mentions an actual historical personage, Abraham. So number one, there's nothing contextual to suggest it's not, it's not based on an actual encounter that took place in the afterlife. And number two... The fact that it's referring to an actual event that actually took place after the death of the rich man and Lazarus is the fact that Jesus mentions an actual historical person, Abraham. You get my point? Now, again, that's not irrefutable. We have to be honest to Scripture. And someone can say, well, this is the exception that proves the norm. In other words, just because Jesus mentions an actual historical character who actually existed, doesn't make the parable an actual encounter. He can simply be using an actual figure to illustrate a point because Abraham was known for his hospitality, right? So it's not ironclad. Mm -hmm. It's not clear proof, irrefutable evidence. But unless and until someone gives me evidence to the contrary, I'm going to assume and believe it's referring to an actual encounter that took place between Abraham, Lazarus, and the rich man. Everyone with me there? Is that clear? Okay. Okay, now let's unpack the meat of the of the parable. Now, Protestant won't be able to stay for too long. He's got to leave. So let's read Luke 16. We're going to read 19 to 23. No, the context is not attested in Daniel and Revelation. Because Daniel 12 and Revelation is talking about the future, the resurrection where people who are raised will be damned. So, Samson, don't try too hard to make it actual because it's going to backfire against you. No, Samson, I'm going to actually ban you because you're disturbing me. You need to go, buddy. Hold on. Here's another know-it-all. Too many chiefs, not enough Indians, who thinks he knows the scriptures, and he actually doesn't know because what he's referring to in Daniel 12 is about the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead, as is Revelation. But because, again, you don't listen well, 
you need to go, my friend. Sorry. Hold on. Sorry about that. Yeah. Unbelievable, man. Anyway, look 16, 19, and 23. Let's read. Let's read. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. <clears throat> And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his swords. I'm going to unpack this section by section by the grace of the Holy Spirit, trusting the Lord Jesus to enable me to do justice to this parable and dig deep into the context. Now, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, right? 23. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell... The Greek word is Hades, and I'm not trying to impress you with the Greek. That's irrelevant. But in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, let's unpack this. Number one, here you have a rich man that's feasting. He's a hedonist. You know, He's engaged in debauchery, in revelry, in eating, in feasting, in gorging himself. And yet you have this poor man, Lazarus, at his gate. Now, because this man is rich, that means he would have servants. And these servants would have brought it to his attention. There's a poor man at your gate who's starving. And the rich man showed him no compassion, compassion no mercy whatsoever, ignored Lazarus, and could care less about his plight and condition. You with me there? You understand what's happening here? Do you see the cruelty? The mercilessness, the selfishness, the wickedness, the evil heart of the rich man. Are you catching it? But here's the irony where you're not catching it. Our Lord Jesus said, dogs came and licked Lazarus' sores in order to give him some comfort. The assumption is, as they licked his sores, that licking gave him momentary relief, momentary comfort. You with me there? So you got so many chiefs here that I want to start muzzling like you do with rabid dogs. And I'm talking about dogs. They can't shut up. Here you have Mesky trying to chime in saying that Abraham's bosom was a Jewish concept. But because he's an ignoramus and being stupid, he does understand that it's a concept centered on Abraham and his hospitality. So you don't separate the concept from the person that gave a rise to that concept. See this stupid people. I'm sorry. Stupid people. Use of the devil to distract because they think they know scripture. Okay. Now, do you see the part about the dogs licking Lazarus? Okay. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to write down the following verses. Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, Philippians 3, verse 2. 2 Peter 2, 22, 2 Peter 2, 22, and Revelation 22, 15. The particular word for dog here that the Lord Jesus uses is used for a scoundrel, a rabid dog, a scoundrel that's good for nothing but to be destroyed. It is the metaphor that Jesus uses for unregenerate rebel sinners who are on their way to hell. That's the term that he uses a rabid dog, an untamed dog, a wild dog, a scoundrel. Right? That's and that word is used in Matthew 7, 6, Philippians 3, verse 2, 2 Peter 2, 22, and Revelation 22, 15. Now, do me a favor. Protestant post Revelation 22, 15. Watch here. Watch what's going to happen. Revelation 22, 15. Okay. For without our dogs, outside the kingdom of God, outside the kingdom of Christ, outside of heaven, our dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Whoever loves lying. Notice here the term dog is used for unregenerate rebel sinners who well, now will be cast into hell to be destroyed. Now, there is another word 
used for dog that doesn't have this connotation. This other word means a puppy, a beloved pet, a pet that's near and dear to the heart of the of the master. That's used in Matthew 15, 26 to 27. Are you with me? Am I boring you? Am I torturing you? Are you learning? You're being blessed. You're, you're learning and seeing the beauty and depth of Scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 15, 26 to 27. Watch here. Okay, now read. But he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And then notice what she responded, the Syrophoenician. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Now this word for dog is different from the other one. And you see the difference. Because notice these dogs are in the house with the children before the master's table. So they're not scoundrels, right? Mongrels. They're not rabid dogs, dogs that are good for nothing but to be destroyed, right? They are house pets. They are puppies. They're in the home. They're near, dear to the master's heart, and they're there with the children and right by the table. Do you catch it? Now, before I move on, the two words in the Greek will be kuon and kenarion, or kenarios, kuon. And canarios. You can look at the blue letter Bible.org to see. Okay, now the word that Jesus uses in Luke 16 is the word for a mongrel, scoundrel, a raby dog, an untamed dog, you know, a dog that's good for nothing but to be destroyed. But you understand the irony there, right? You understand the irony? Now, Paul, you know I'm going to block you for asking me to debate someone in the midst of a session. You need to leave, Paul. Don't come back. Send him on his way so he can learn his lesson. Right? Okay. Right? Now, you understand what Jesus was getting at by that use of the term dog? He's saying, notice the irony here. Here's a rich man who showed less compassion and mercy than these rapey dogs, these mongrels, because even these dogs, as evil as they are, as untamed as they are, as ravenous as they are, as rabid as they are, showed more compassion than the rich man, showing that the rich man is worse than these dogs. You understand the irony? You understand what Jesus just showed? This rich man is worse than these dogs, rapey dogs, ravenous dogs, mongrels, undomesticated, running wild and loose in the streets, showed more compassion for Lazarus than this rich man, showing the rich man is worse than these dogs. Is it sinking in? Is it sinking in? You see the irony. Okay, now, if you're seeing it and you're not getting confused and you're getting blessed and challenged, I want you to notice another thing. It says Lazarus died in that condition. And the rich man died feasting, died gorging himself, engaging in a hedonistic, rebellious, lifestyle full of debauchery right you caught you caught it right lazarus died in his pitiful state the rich man died feasting lavishing on his 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 wealth and enjoying life to the fullest what's the lesson you're supposed to learn from here it is not it is not necessarily the case that just because you're a Christian who loves Jesus, that God will deliver you from your trials on earth. Lazarus was a servant of God, loved of the Lord, but God allowed him to die in that pitiful condition and never delivered him in this lifetime. And the other thing you're supposed to learn, just because you're a rebel sinner, 
feasting and lavishing in your re revelry doesn't mean you'll be punished in this lifetime. God may allow you to enjoy life to the full till you die because your retribution comes in the life hereafter. Rocco, no, I don't want to bring people. I'm trying to get rid of tears. You don't like it, Rocco. Take a hike. Get lost. Don't come back. I don't know how much clear I can make it. Don't come back, Rocco, because you're going to get blocked. I don't know. I don't know how much more clear I can make it. I'm not looking for numbers. You don't like it? Get lost. I'm looking for people who are sincere and want to hear the presentation and take it back and study it to see where I'm wrong, where I'm right. And if I'm right, accept it and preach it for the glory of Christ. I don't know how many sessions I need to repeat myself. I really don't. But coming back to the issue here, coming back to this. Did you see that the rich man lived lavishly to the full till he died, whereas a servant of God, okay, servant of God, a servant of God was allowed to suffer till the end, and God never delivered them in this lifetime. So what you're supposed to learn from the parable of Jesus, okay, is that just because you're a believer doesn't mean God will save you from your cal calamities. What God will do is preserve you through your calamities so that you don't falter and lose your faith, but makes sure by the power of the Holy Spirit, your faith in Christ remains intact till the very end. Rocco, stop commenting. There is no need for you to comment and distract me. I'm going to block you, brother. Stop. Everyone with me there? Everyone getting it so far before I move on? I want, Before I move on, like I said, there's going to be meat in this passage. There's going to be meat in this passage if you listen and stop allowing the devil to cause you to bring distractions. Wow. Sorry to hear that, Lopez. May the Lord Jesus preserve you, flood you in his infant love, compassion, mercy, seal you by his Holy Spirit, and the blood of Jesus be your shield and your family shield, my shield and my family shield in Jesus' name. I'm sorry to hear that, brother. Thank you for being so brutally honest. Okay, now, if you got that point, let's go back and look at Luke 16, 22 one more time. Luke 16, 22, one more time. Thank you, Conquest uh, for Christ. Keep praying. He fills me with knowledge, wisdom, power, understanding, faithfulness, holiness, love, devotion, to be de devoted to Jesus. Luke 16, 22. Now watch here. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Okay, first question for every one of you, if you're paying attention. Guys, are you paying attention? It says, when the beggar died, the angels carried him. Carried what? Vine, I hope you're listening, and I am not. hope I'm not distracting you. Carried what? The rich man died, and the beggar died, and the angels carried him. Carried the beggar. They weren't carrying the body. The body returned to the dust. That means they were carrying his spirit. But hold on, folks. How do you carry a person's spirit if the spirit doesn't have a shape or form of some kind? You understand where I'm going with this? The very fact that angels could carry the soul slash spirit of the beggar because his body died, returned to the dust, shows you that there's a part of you that's not your physical body, what we call your soul or spirit. That has a shape and form of some kind that continues to exist apart from your physical body. And that's what the angels carried. You want me there? Are you catching it? Before I move on to the next point. Sorry about the camera. It's the best we can do right now. Okay. 
Now, let's look at Luke 16, 22 to 23 one more time. I told you I'm going to go slow with this, very slow. I'm going to do this session. Hopefully, we won't get more distractions so that people listening later won't get distracted and frustrated and complain to me because I don't want to cause them to stumble. Luke 16, 22, 23. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels. Now, pay attention about the rich man. And to Abraham's wisdom, the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, question for everyone else. Everyone. It says the rich man was buried. So what part of him landed in hell? What part of the rich man was being tormented in hell if he was buried? What part of him was buried? What part of him was in hell? Do you see the irrefutable proof from this parable that soul sleep, that when you die, you go to sleep and you're not conscious after you die is unbiblical? Which is why those who believe in soul sleep like seven-day Adventists have to explain this parable away and deny the reality thereof. Because this parable shows you, though your body sleeps, meaning it returns to the dust, your soul slash spirit continues to exist consciously apart from your body. You see why they have to deny that this is based on an actual encounter, an actual ex exchange in the afterlife, because it's a nightmare for their position. Right? It's a nightmare for their position, folks. Now, Moffat asked the question, when we die, will we recognize one another? Well, let's look at Luke 16, 23 to 25. Luke 16, 23 to 25. God bless you too, Joe Oroni. Luke 16, 23, 25. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Pay attention to the language, folks. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am, I am tormented in this flame. Wait, 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 wait. So in the afterlife, the rich man realized that's Abraham, my father, and there's Lazarus. He could distinguish between them, knowing they're not the same person. He knew who Abraham was, and he also says that Lazarus has fingers, and then there's a pool, there's water there, in which Lazarus can dip his finger and then cool his tongue. So he's got eyes, he has tongue, Lazarus has fingers, there's water. What's going on here? Not physical, King of Kings. See, this is where you fell for the trap. No, it's not physical. If physical, you mean made of this material substance of this earth? No. The afterlife is not made of this material substance, the substance we find on the earth. However, don't let anyone tell you, unless they've been to heaven to see it for themselves, that the spiritual dimension is devoid of anything substantial. If they tell you, well, it can't be literal because there isn't water in heaven, how do you know? You've been there? You've seen it? How can you tell me what can and cannot be in heaven if you haven't been there? So why don't you shut up and be humble and let Jesus tell you, tell you about heaven and hell and the afterlife because he created it. You get my point? It kills me when you have these so-called scholars, know-it-alls. Oh, no, but that's a spiritual dimension. And we know this is all metaphor. How do you know that? How do you know that a spiritual dimension is devoid of anything substantial? That there isn't anything material in the spiritual dimension. I'm not saying it's made of this physical stuff that belongs to the earth. But heaven itself is a dimension of time, space, and place. The only being, the only being that's timeless, spaceless, placeless is God. Everything that came into being is part of the time, space, place. You with me there?
So if I just take Jesus' words at face value, in their spiritual form, their spiritual shape, when you see them, it looks like they have hands, fingers, eyes, and a mouth. That's why Lazarus could be recognized by the rich man, and he could recognize that Lazarus is someone different from Abraham. Can you hear me? Sound coming? Hold on. Can you guys hear me? Okay, good, because you're saying sound. I don't know. Don't. Yeah, what are you going to do, friend? This is the best I can do, unless you want me to just stop. As long as you're getting the gist of the points, right? Hafsa, didn't we just read about dogs licking Lazarus? These are dogs trying to comfort me. So what's your problem, Hafsa? All right? Okay. Yeah, because they want to also get involved in the discussion. They're answering my questions. Okay, what's wrong with you? These dogs understand when someone's talking about their creator. So they want to enter the discussion and they want to amen. What's wrong with you guys, man? Oh, you have little faith. Okay. You get, you're getting it now? Okay. So did you see that in the afterlife, these spirit beings have spiritual shapes and forms that's not made of the same physical substance on earth, but it's still a material form, something substantial, tangible, where they can touch and be touched. Send Ransford on his merry way, this filthy dog. You, you catch it? But I want you to catch the irony. When Lazarus was on earth, he was at the mercy of the rich man and wanted the rich man to feed him, right? You saw that, right? But then in the afterlife, notice the role reversal, the vindication and justice of God. The rich man is now at the mercy of Lazarus. At the mercy of Lazarus. Because now he wants Lazarus to cool him from his torment. Whereas when Lazarus was on earth, he was at the mercy of the rich man and the rich man showed him none. And so what you learn here is if you show no mercy, you will obtain no mercy. If you don't give someone mercy, you will not receive mercy. And here I may be at your mercy, but in the afterlife, you'll be at my mercy. And this is how God vindicates the righteous and punishes the wicked. But I want you to see the arrogance of the rich man. I don't know if you caught it. Even now in hell, he's still not repentant. He's still not remorseful for what he did to Lazarus. You know how I know? Because he's ordering Abraham to order Lazarus as if Abraham and Lazarus are still his servants. And he has the power and authority to command them what to do for his benefit. You caught it? Luke 16, 24, 25, one more time. No remorse, no repentance, no, I am sorry for what I've done, Father Abraham. Lazarus, forgive me, I was wicked. No remorse, no repentance, no conviction. Notice the attitude, the arrogance. He's still bossing people around. Pay attention. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus. Wait, wait, wait. You you want Abraham to tell Lazarus what to do? To benefit you? Notice the audacity. He doesn't even address Lazarus. Are you catching it? He's addressing Abraham and wants Abraham to command Lazarus to reach out and help him in his torment. Send Lazarus. Right? Let me read it. Let me finish it. That he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented. Like, notice, again, it's about him. Notice the selfishness and self-centeredness. Tell Lazarus to come and cool my tongue. Tell Lazarus to do something that benefits me. No repentance. No, I'm sorry, Father Abraham. I'm ashamed for failing Lazarus. I should have shown him mercy. 
I deserve what I get for neglecting Lazarus. What are you supposed to take away from this? Even hell doesn't make people repent. Okay. Even hell will not make you repent. The sin nature is so strong, and someone who's dead in sin is so enslaved to sin and so molded by sin that even the torments of hell will not move you to repentance. And Lord willing, I will do a session proving that from Scripture, that Jesus describes torment in such a manner to suggest that those being tormented do not repent but continue hating God more and more for the punishment that God pours out on them. I'll do a session on that to prove that point. But, yep, Gerald, you got it. Gerald just said it. Whenever, whenever Jesus speaks about outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth, that phrase, gnashing of teeth, every time it's used in the Bible, it refers to a person gnashing his teeth from anger and rage. And so in Matthew 8, 12, he talks about unbelievers being thrown out into the outer darkness where they'll be weeping, gnashing of teeth. Why will people be gnashing their teeth in hell? People think because of the pain. No, it's because of the anger and hatred and rage. Like, oh, you. But who will they be gnashing their teeth at? If you want to write down the references, as Matthew chapter 8, verse 12. <clears throat> Matthew 13, 42 and 50. Write these down. Matthew 13, verses 42 and 50. <clears throat> Matthew 22, verse 13, and Matthew 25, 30. Matthew 25, 30, Matthew 22, 13, Matthew 13, verses 42 and 50, and Matthew 8, 12. Right? So anyway, here's another thing you learn from the parable. Those who are in hell are not necessarily remorseful or repentant. They're still selfish, self-centered, and it's still about them. I'm going to prove to you it's still about them, that they're still selfish. Notice he wants Abraham to tell Lazarus what to do to benefit him, right? I guess Carm's going to be posting verses, sister, if you don't mind. Post Luke 16, 25. Yeah, exactly, Jason. You, you nailed it. Narcissists. You nailed it, brother. Carm, can you put can you post it or not? Luke 16, 25. Okay. God bless you, Leon. Luke 16, 25. No, Walid, I can. Can you do it, Carm? Let me know if you can't, sister, because I don't want to waste. Okay, thank you. God bless you, sister. Thank you so much. She jumped in at the last minute. I'm trying to just balance this. All right. No, it's okay, sister. It's not so. I didn't know if you could. Let me just balance this. Hold on. Sorry. So I don't have to hold it. Sorry about that. Uh -oh. Okay. Luke 16, 25. Watch here. Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Did you catch it now? Roll reversal again. Roll reversal. You feasted, party, lived it up, and Lazarus received evil things. Now he's comforted, and you're tormented. Why are you complaining? You're getting what you deserve. Lazarus is vindicated. He's now finally comforted, and his comfort is everlasting. You enjoy life temporarily. You had temporary pleasures that have ended, and now your torment begins. Lazarus had temporary affliction, and now he will experience everlasting comfort. Is that clear? Do you see? Role reversal. The, the rich man is now at the mercy of Lazarus, whereas Lazarus in this world was at the mercy of the rich man. 
He showed no mercy. He receives none. Lazarus is comforted. The rich man is tormented. Whereas Lazarus on earth never received deliverance from his affliction, but God gave him the power of the Holy Spirit, the grace to endure and not lose faith till the end, and now he's comforted. Whereas the wicked prospered till he died, and now he's tormented. Do you see the meat in this parable? Is it unbelievable how much meat there is in the Word of God? The depth of God's Word that I haven't even come close to penetrating. Is it unbelievable or what? Who would have thunk there was so much meat in this parable? Would you guys have assumed this parable that Jesus gives and doesn't expound? Because he's going to give us the Holy Spirit to illuminate us, to dig deep into the words of Christ and expound them for the glory of Christ. Who would have thought there was this much meat about the afterlife? Is it amazing? Now notice what he says in Luke 16, 26. Luke 16, 26. Amen, John. Luke 16, 26. Watch here. Whoever posts it. If not, I'll just read it from BibleGateway.com. Whoever wants to post it. Watch. This is what I like here. Because it shows you once you die... Your condition is irreversible. It's now fixed and set forever. Luke 16, 26. And besides all this, besides all this between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Understand what you just read. Once you die, your condition is irreversible. It's done. It's over with. There is no second chance. You can't come to us. We can't come to you. Even if I wanted to show you mercy, I can't because there's a gulf separating us. You stay there. We stay here, here and the two shall never meet. The two shall never meet. Okay, so let me just recap real quickly because I'm going to tie in with the Hebrew scriptures in a minute. Number one, what you learned is the righteous do not necessarily receive vindication in this world. God will give us the power of the Holy Spirit to endure and never falter or deny him, no matter what we experience, even though we may experience something that may result in our death. And the reverse is true of the wicked. The wicked may never experience torment, punishment here, but God may allow the wicked to prosper in his revelry, revelry, immorality, hedonism till he dies. And you know, it's a perfect example of the rich man, a modern example of the rich man for those of you living in the U.S. A perfect example of the rich man in modern times who lived at large was a filthy, wicked demon who whored women. And became a millionaire off, the, off of prostituting women. And became rich. Hugh Hefner of Playboy. Right? Hugh Hefner of Playboy. Even to his 70s, he was getting married to models. Making millions off of women that he prostituted. Hoard around. Would have parties, debauchery, orgies, you name it. And he lived in that lifestyle till he died. Tell me that's not a modern example of the rich man. And here you have brothers and sisters in Christ suffering, being tortured, imprisoned, murdered, raped, enslaved. And even over here. In, in, in America, where we don't have it as bad. You have my brother, David Wood, skin cancer. He's got two boys with a rare muscular genetic disorder. Five sons, an amazing godly woman, a Proverbs 31 wife who holds down the fort. Sister-in-law who died of an aneurysm. A mother who had cancer in her lungs and had to have part of her lung removed. You name it. And notice that man still in love with Jesus 
still destroying the kingdom of darkness, the, the kingdom of Islam, still remaining faithful, and his wife sold out for Jesus, in love with Jesus, and by the Holy Spirit, he remained that way till the end. See the difference? At times, struggling. Struggling financially. For years, I remember him struggling, right? Financially. And yet, because he had such an amazing godly wife, she never complained. She never put a burden on him. Never told him, you better stop ministry, otherwise I'm going to leave. She remained a trooper and loved him faithfully. That's my brother David Wood, and it's Proverbs 31, wife. Folks, I can testify. I was at their home for several weeks. I can testify before the Lord. His wife, Marie Wood, is a Proverbs 31 woman. She is his Sarah. He doesn't know how blessed he is to have someone like that. Right? I'm telling you, I've, I've been there. I know, she's amazing. The thing she has to go through on a daily basis, caring for five boys, two with special needs, also making sure that David Wood is able to focus to destroy the kingdom of Islam, which is the kingdom of Satan for the glory of Jesus, right? And all these other issues with family. She is just as much a warrior, in fact, more so than David. Okay? Okay. Follower of Christ, why are you allowing son of Rome, meaning son of Satan, to distract you because he wants you to focus on him, not focus on the text? It's true, love and light. It's true. And again, I'm not complaining and trying to appeal to, to pity. But for two years, brethren, I was thrown out of my house in the cold. I had to stay with a friend in his garage that he converted into an apartment until... My older brother took me in, going through courts, month in, month out, with a corrupt judge who hates men and wants to destroy men, a corrupt legal system, even a lawyer, my own lawyer, being wicked and lying to me, deceiving me, right? Putting me in a financial debt of over $40,000, not seeing my kids for months, having to leave that state so I can start fresh in a new state right who do you think gave me the grace to endure who do you think it is that's empowering me right now to do this live stream magnify jesus with passion if not the living god father son and spirit if not the holy spirit in us this is what the parable is teaching you if you belong to the lord and i pray i belong to him and I'll know it if I remain faithful to the end. If you belong to the Lord, he hasn't promised that he'll save you from trials, but he's promised to preserve you with his perfect love and power through your trials so that no trial will make you deny him and walk away. And that's what we see in the story of Lazarus. That's what you're learning from this parable. So don't be deceived. You know, just because you follow Jesus doesn't mean if you're going th before a corrupt judge that somehow God is going to turn that judge's heart favorably so that you're going to receive a favorable verdict. It doesn't work that way. Because the judges and this world system is under the influence of Satan. And Satan's going to work through this corrupt legal system to persecute Christians in order to make them deny their faith. But King Jesus is there. And you know what he says? Hands off of this one, Satan. This one is my sheep in my hand. And you can throw anything at him. He will not falter because I will preserve him till the end. Hit your best shot. Shoot your best shot. That's what Jesus says. In fact, it's moving me in my spirit. Hands off, Satan. You can do anything to this man. You can imprison this man. You can torture this man. You can even kill his family. You can inflict him with disease. But his allegiance, his heart, his mind, his soul are mine. That you will never touch. Right? 
Anyway. You with me there? Now let's continue in Luke 16. Let's continue in Luke 16. Yep. And Jurgen, learn to keep your comments to yourself, my friend. And learn to leave my channel right now. Luke 16. Yes, it is. Luke 16. Let's now pick it up at 27 to 31. 27 to 31. Luke 16, 27, 31. Yep. George, learn to keep your opinions for yourself because right now you're telling us what to do even though you want us to read the Bible. Let the Bible tell us what to do. So you're a hypocrite because you're stupid. You see? And that's what I do to stupid folks. Hold on. George, George, George of the jungle. All right. Luke 16, 26 to 31. Let's read. I'm sorry, it's 27 to 31. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Now watch what happens. Re guys, pay attention to the arrogance, the audacity of this rich man again. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they... They will not also come to this place of torment. Now, vine, everyone else, pay attention to this. Vine, everyone else. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham. But if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And 31, watch here. Watch the arrogance of this man again. Watch the arrogance of this man again. Watch here. 31, I'm just waiting for 31 so we can finish it. Come on, guys, help me out. 31, I'm going to start reading. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Again, watch the arrogance and the selfishness of the rich man. Guys, pay attention, please. Notice again, he's telling Abraham what to do and telling Abraham to tell Lazarus what to do. And notice his selfishness again. He's again concerned about his own. He's concerned about his five brothers, even though he had no concern for Lazarus. Do you see the selfishness of this man in the parable? Are you catching the selfishness, the self-centeredness of this man? He's again concerned about his own, telling Abraham what to do, how to do it, and telling Abraham to tell Lazarus what to do. And he's concerned about the fate of his five brothers and no one else. But hold on. Why weren't you as concerned about Lazarus? And when then Abraham told, told him they got the Old Testament, he goes, no, 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 no. That's not good. He's again telling Abraham what will work and what won't work. Do you see the arrogance of the rich man in the parable? Do you see what the Lord wants us to see? That even in torment, he's not repented. Even in torment, he still thinks that he's a gift and that people must kowtow to him and bow the knee to him and do what he expects them to do. Do you see how disgusting this rich man is? Are you catching it? Was there any change in the man? Let me know if you're catching this or you're not catching it. Isn't it blowing you away that even torment doesn't cause him to repent? Even torment doesn't convict him to change and take responsibility and ask for forgiveness. Even in a state of torment, he's still unrepentant. Because his condition is irreparable. It cannot be re repaired apart from the Holy Spirit. Telling Abraham what to do, what not to do, how to do it. Telling Abraham to tell Lazarus to serve him and his needs. Sinking in? Is it making sense? So one thing I want you to take away from this, I'm almost done, I'm going to cross from the uh, Old Testament, is that even torment, punishment, does not change a person's character. Only the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit alone is able to change your character, to take you from a sinner and turn you into a saint. That's what you learned here. And I want this to sink in because if someone tells you, will we recognize one another in the afterlife? Yes, you will. 
Here is proof from the parable. Lazarus knew who Abraham was. He knew that was my father Abraham. He recognized him. He knew that was Lazarus. And Abraham knew about his plight on earth. So that means in the afterlife, even though you don't have a physical body, as a soul, as a spirit, you have a shape and form of some kind by which a person can recognize and identify you. Clear? Did that answer that question? Will we recognize one another in the afterlife? But here's where I want you to be blown away. Here's where I want you to be blown away. Watch how much meat there is in the Old Testament, in this parable. Abraham tells Lazarus, your brothers on earth have Moses and the prophets, which is simply the New Testament way of saying the Old Testament. They have the Hebrew Bible. Can I ask you a question? Moses and the prophets came centuries after Abraham was dead. And the canon of their writings was only collected centuries later, right? How did Abraham know? That God had sent Moses and the prophets with inspired scriptures that was still in the possession of the people on earth at the time of this conversation. How do you know? How do you know that? Read it again. They have Moses and the prophets. Abraham, how did you know that? Not only that, how did Abraham know the condition of the rich man on earth and the condition of Lazarus on earth? How do you know how they lived on earth? How do you know that? Because contrary to what many Protestants will tell you, it is not true. That the inhabitants of heaven or the afterlife are completely oblivious and ignorant of things that take place on earth. Here you have from the words of Jesus that Abraham in the afterlife knew about events that took place on earth because God makes it known to them. You love that, huh, Vine? God makes it known to them. So, guys, do you want to be Catholic? Orthodox, Protestant, or you do you want to be Biblicist? You want to accept whatever the Bible teaches, even if it teaches something contrary to your Protestantism and agrees with Catholicism, vice versa. What do you guys want to be? If you want to be Biblicist, then that means you need to be open to what the Bible teaches that God does make known to the inhabitants of the afterlife events on earth. And you don't have to be Roman Catholic to believe that. In other words, you don't need to be Orthodox or Catholic to believe in communion of saints. If it's biblical, to believe it means you're being a Biblicist. A Christian who follows the Bible as perfectly as possible. Love and light. So catch what you learned from Abraham. You learned a rich man lived on earth the way Lazarus lived on earth, and you learned that Abraham was aware that they had the Old Testament scriptures inspired to Moses and the prophets, even though these writings came centuries after his death. He knew all that because God had made it known to him. Amos, because the rich man was insignif insignificant and not worthy to be mentioned. Amos, let me tell you why. One reason why Jesus didn't mention the rich man's name. Unbelievers, he does not know. Remember what God said to Moses? I know you by name. But this rich man, because he was wicked, his name wasn't even worthy to be mentioned. Only his condition. You Amos 3.3? If you read Exodus 33, 18 to 23, and Exodus 34, verses 1 to 7, God says to Moses, I've known you by name. Now, knowing him by name means he knows his character. But still, notice the irony. He knows him by name. Not only that he knows his name, Moses, but his character. He knows him intimately. He knows him inside and out. So the irony in the parable is this. 
Whereas Jesus names Abraham because Abraham is his friend. Jesus names Lazarus because Lazarus is a believer whom he loves. The rich man goes unnamed because he never knew him. That's Matthew 7, 23. I will tell them plainly, depart from me, you lawless ones. I never knew you. Send this filthy dog, Unitarian, agent of Satan, who is a non-Trinitarian, and so he worships Satan, not God, with the rich man. Filthy dog. You come in here claiming to be a monotheist Christian, you're nothing but a dog. Filthy dog. Set up a debate so I can demolish you and your God. You filthy, vile dog. And he actually thinks he's welcomed here. Okay, so did it make sense why Jesus didn't mention the rich man by name? Is it sinking in now? Because Jesus doesn't know the wicked. He knows them from afar off. He has no intimate communion with them. You catch it? But the righteous he knows intimately, knows them by name. Matthew 7, 23. I will tell the lawless ones, those who have no regard for my commands, I never knew you. But with Moses, he says, I know you. So he mentions Abraham because God knows him intimately. He's a friend of God. He mentions Lazarus because he he's the righteous. But the rich man goes unnamed. You catching it? Is it sinking in all this meat? With if I have to explain that, you know I'm going to bounce you too. Is that repentance or is that selfishness? That he cares for his brothers, those that belong to him, and he doesn't want them to suffer. Because if he was truly repentant, he would have shown consideration to Lazarus, not just family members. It's like you loving those who love you, Wild. You remember what Jesus says? What good is it if you love those who love you? And if you're kind to those who are kind to you, do I really need to explain that, Wild? Why are you insulting me? Does this concern for his family members show repentance or selfishness again? Because he's all about him and his own, his family and no one else. Do I really need to explain that? Seriously, are you insulting me? I really need to unpack that? Or do you need to spend more time studying the Gospels and understanding what true repentance is and what selfishness is? Selfishness is caring for yourself and your loved ones. Selfishness is being only kind to those who love you and are kind in return. That's not repentance. That's selfishness. Is that clear? Everyone with me so far? Folks, you're going to learn very fast. Very fast. This challenge, this channel is not for you know-it-alls, Weisenheimers, who want to pontificate and debate. Go somewhere else. I'm not inviting you. You're not welcome here. I want people to come and listen to what I have to say. Go back, study the material, re-listen to it. Reject where they think I'm wrong, accept where they, where they think I'm right, and glorify God with it. Not saying believe everything I teach, but at least hear me out. And if you have sincere questions, I don't mind them. But silly questions, attacks disguised as questions, I don't tolerate. No, son of Rome, you should call yourself a son of a filthy dog for asking me about masturbation. You shut up before I muzzle you. Okay? Don't talk. Keep barking to someone else and foam at the mouth. Uh, in fact, you're supposed to be blocked for that stupid comment about should I masturbate? You filthy dog. Is that what your mother taught you? To come in a public chat and talk about masturbation? Because your mother taught you that way. She's your example. You filthy dog. Coming here in, in mixed company and talking about 
masturbation. Power to the people. Uh, because if his mom had taught him well, he'd have manners, right, Nina? Did your mom teach you better than to go on a public forum and talk about masturbating? Do I need to answer that question for you too, Nina? Okay. Now, if we got all that thus far, in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to be more strict in the future. And as soon as I see a troll, they're getting bounced because I don't want to be a disservice to you and distract you listening. Forgive me by the grace of the Lord Jesus. Okay, now, did we get that so far, all this meat? Did you get all this meat? Did you learn that according to this parable, you'll recognize one another in the afterlife? You will recognize one another. According to this parable, just because a person is being tormented doesn't mean that person will be prone to repent. Because even torment doesn't change you. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, not torment. In fact, it's an insult to God to say that being tormented will change your character. And yet the Holy Spirit can convict you and resist the Holy Spirit and not repent. Here we go. Hater would with who needs attention. Now, and you also learned that Abraham was aware of things that took place on earth after his passing. Did we get all that? Did we learn that? That after Abraham's pa passing, Abraham was aware of the condition and plight of Lazarus and the rich man on earth. Okay, okay almost done. Sorry, I got distracted. Okay. Rich man and Lazarus on earth, right? He knew their plight. He knew their condition. He knew their situation. And he knew that the people on earth after his death had the Old Testament scriptures. So the people who depart from us are not completely oblivious from things that take place on earth because God can and does make things known to them, especially the plight of believers on earth. I already did a session on this. I did a multi-part session on communion of saints, and I went in depth, verse after verse, to document this. But now, let me prove to you from the Old Testament that what you read in this parable is based on actual encounter because these things do actually occur in the afterlife. You with me there? Let me now give you Old Testament proof, Old Testament basis, Old Testament foundation that what you read in this parable is based on actual encounters, actual experiences in the afterlife, what actually takes place in the afterlife. Are you ready? Are you ready? Who's ready? Okay. Let's relook at Luke 16, 25, 26. Luke 16, 25, 26. Let's relook at that. Let's relook at it because I'm going to have to shut down in a few minutes. Okay. But Abraham said, Son, remember. In thy lifetime, receive thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Did you catch it? Pay attention to what Abraham said. Lazarus is comforted here, but you are tormented. Can you guys remember that? Can you remember what Abraham just said? Lazarus is comforted here, but you are tormented. And then notice 26 26 and hide all this between us and you. There's a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from. Is that clear? Did you catch what he said? There's a gulf here. There's two sections here, right? There's two sections here and a gulf that separates the two sections. Lazarus and I are in comfort. You're on the other side. You're in torment. Notice, though they go to the same place or dimension, not all of them are in the same condition. A group are in comfort, experiencing rest and peace. Another group is in torment, right? Did you catch that? Vine, everyone else, are you catching it? Is everyone catching that? You sure? All right. Let's go to Genesis 15, 15. Are you sure? All right. Let's go to Genesis 15, 15. Let's go to Genesis 15, 15.
vine, if the dead, their condition is fixed and irreparable, irreversible, then what's the point of praying for them? If they're in heaven, they need your prayer vine. If they're in hell, you can't pray them out of hell, right? Okay, Genesis 15, 15, read with me. Notice what God tells Abraham. Genesis 15, 15, notice what God tells Abraham. And you, Abraham, shall go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be married in a good old age. Guys, you really have to pay attention to this. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. Now, I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to take a moment today and read Genesis 23. Okay, guys, are you listening? I need you to pay attention to what we just read. Genesis 23, Abraham purchased the cave of Mechphelah from the Canaanites, the cave of Mechphelah, in order to bury Sarah there. The only person buried in that cave was Sarah. None of Abraham's fathers, none of Abraham's brothers were buried in the cave except Sarah. Sarah was buried in the cave of Mechphelah, and only she was buried in that cave, no one else. That's Genesis 23. Okay. Now let's look, let's look at Genesis 15, 15 one more time. One more time. Almost done. I'm going to have to end it here after this. Genesis 15, 15. One more time. And thou, Abraham, you, Abraham, shall go to thy father's. You're going to go to your fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. God says to Abraham, Abraham, I will gather you. You will go to your fathers in peace. And he emphasizes in peace. And you'll be buried at a good old age. Hmm. Now let's go to Genesis 25 verses 8 to 9. Genesis 25 verses 8 to 9. Then Abraham gave up the ghost. Notice, he gave up his spirit. I love this translation. He gave up his spirit. So his spirit left his body and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years and was gathered to his people. Pay attention. Gathered to his people. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah and the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, which is before Memre. Hmm. Genesis 25, 8 to 9. One more time. 25, 8 to 9. One more time. Here's where you're going to get blown away, Vine. Pay attention. Abraham gave up the ghost. So why did he die? His spirit left his body. Spirit left his body. And died in a good old age, like God said, an old man full of years and was gathered to his people. But notice, it says he's gathered to his people. But then in, 29, in verse 9 it says, in verse 9 it says, and his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah. Now, guys, it says when his spirit left his body, gave up his spirit, his spirit left his body, he was gathered to his people. But then afterwards, his sons buried his body in the cave. Guys, I'm confused. How could he be gathered to his people, to his fathers, when he was buried next to Sarah in the cave and none of his fathers were in the cave? The only one buried there was Sarah. So when they buried his body, he was gathered to Sarah. He wasn't gathered to any of his fathers or his people because his fathers died in Ur of Chaldee and his own father died in Haran. But it says that when he died, his spirit left and was gathered to his people, to his fathers. Hmm. I guess you guys didn't catch it. Let's see who caught it. Who caught it? You guys are all silent. Come on, don't tell me you can't hear me now. Who caught it? Who caught what happened? He breathed up his last. He gave up his spirit. He was gathered with his fathers, his ancestors. But then the sons took the body and buried it in the cave. And the only other one in the cave was Sarah. So his body was not gathered to his fathers because his fathers were buried in Ur of Chaldee. And his own father was buried in Haran. But it says when his spirit left, he was gathered to his people, his ancestors, his fathers.
In other words, when a spirit left his body, he gathered the other spirits. He gathered with the other spirits who had died. So what God was telling him is, Abraham, when you die, your spirit will be gathered with your fathers, with your people in this dimension, the netherworld, the spiritual dimension that Jesus calls Abraham's bosom. It wasn't called that at that time. But that's where your spirit's going to go, where all the spirits of the dead are gathered and waiting. Whereas your body will be buried next to Sarah in the cave. So your body will be only with Sarah, but your spirit will be with all the other spirits that are all gathered in the spiritual dimension. But then notice what he says in Genesis 15, 15. Genesis 15, 15. No, he did not get a new divine body. Why? Please don't twist scripture. There's nothing divine about your body when you die. It's your spirit that has a shape. It's no body. And when your body is raised, it's still a physical body that's not divine. It's made immortal. Genesis 15, 15. Now you understand why God said, when you gather to your fathers, you will be there in peace. Do you know why he said that? What does the skin have to do with the spirit? The skin will be destroyed and then re Constitute resurrected when Jesus returns. We're talking about the spirit that leaves the body. Okay. Now, does it make sense why God told Abraham, you'll be gathered to your fathers in peace? Exactly, God with the hero hunter. Why did he assure him, when you are gathered to your fathers, you'll be gathered there in peace? Vine, Vine, how can it be silent about the afterlife when I just gave you proof of it from the Torah? How can it be silent about the afterlife when I just gave you proof from the Torah? It's not silent. Vine. Right? You guys keep calling it heaven. I'm not calling it heaven. I'm calling it Abraham's bosom. Okay. Does it make sense now why God says to Abraham, even though I'm gathering you to your fathers, you will be there in peace? What's the implication? What's the implication? What's the implication? Why does he have to re reassure Abraham when you go there, you'll be in peace? Because you read Jesus' parable. Jesus now explains and fills out the details to understand what God meant. Because didn't you remember Luke 16 why I told you pay attention 25, 26? Didn't Abraham say to the rich man, Lazarus is comfort here. Where he is, where I'm at, we're at comfort. You're in torment. Now it makes sense. Now Genesis 15, 15, Genesis 25, 8 to 9 makes sense in light of Jesus' parable. Oh, that means not everyone there is in peace. There are some who are tormented. But Abraham, you don't need to be afraid because I promise when you go there, you won't be tormented. You'll be in peace. And Jesus confirms it 2,000 years later. Jesus confirms God's faithfulness in keeping his promise because Jesus shows us that Abraham was in peace after all. So Jesus just gave you confidence to take God at his word and know that God can never lie and will never lie to you. And if he makes a promise, he will keep it. He promised Abraham, I will gather you to your fathers, but you'll be in peace. And then Jesus, 2,000 years later, shows us by the parable, Abraham is in peace, in comfort. In fact, he owns the place. Did everyone get that before I move to the next point? Vine, did you get it? Do you see why now Luke 16 is not simply a parable, meaning that it's simply a story, but it's not based on actual interactions, encounters, or a description of what actually takes place in the afterlife? Is it making sense now? In light of the Old Testament, we know it's not simply a story, 
but it is based on what actually occurs in the afterlife. This is what it's like in the afterlife. There are those believers in peace and comfort and unbelievers in torment. And they recognize one another, recognize one another. Exactly, LOTV Gaming. Did you get it, Vine? You see how much meat there is in this book, Old and New Testaments, and how they confirm one another? Now when you read Genesis 15, 15, it makes sense, doesn't it? Abraham, I will gather you to your fathers in peace. Peace? Yes, because not everyone there is in peace. Many are tormented, but you have nothing to fear. You'll be there in peace awaiting the Messiah to open up the gates of heaven to bring you into my heavenly presence where you and all believers will dwell with angels. But you're going to have to wait there until he does that. And then Jesus comes 2,000 years later and says, Abraham and Lazarus in a place of peace and comfort. And Abraham's actually running the show. He's the boss there. And there's another part of it in that same dimension where unbelievers are tormented. Now, to answer the question, up until Jesus' physical bodily resurrection and ascension into heaven, no one went to God's heavenly dwelling place. Up until the time of Jesus, everyone went to this spiritual dimension that we'll call Sheol or Hades, Hades. It was only after Jesus' physical bodily resurrection and ascension to heaven that all those believers who are in a place of comfort were taken to now dwell with the Father and Jesus and angels in heaven. But up until that point, they went to what we call Sheol, Hades, Hades, or what we call Abraham's bosom. You with me there? Sam Sophie, to truly believe in Jesus is to obey his teachings because Satan believes that Jesus is son of God, but he still goes to hell because he doesn't obey his teaching. Okay, so you understand what you just learned? Up until Jesus' ascension into heaven, up until Jesus' ascension into heaven, no one entered God's heavenly place where God dwells visibly with the angels, not even Enoch. Why would you ask me that, Moses? If you read Hebrews 11, Enoch is mentioned, and clearly it says that Enoch did not enter heaven. That's in Hebrews 11. Yes, Sheol or Hades is one dimension, one place rational, not two. But up until the time of Christ, it had two compartments, two sections. Now, after Jesus' ascension, Sheol Hades only has one compartment, one section. Why? Because that section compartment where believers dwelt in peace is no longer needed because now the spirits of all believers enter God's heavenly presence where they behold God the Father visibly, the angels, and Jesus Christ. You with me there? Before I conclude in Hebrews 12, 22, 24, did everyone see the amount of meat in Luke 16, 19 to 31? Everyone, line bar, will be resurrected. The wicked will be raised in their bodies to be thrown into hell, body and soul together. The righteous will be raised in their bodies to dwell with Jesus in their glorified bodies forever and ever. Because line bar, human beings were not created to be spirits. They were created to be embodied spirits, spirits with flesh bodies. And that's why Jesus will raise their physical bodies because human beings are spirits that are clothed with flesh, flesh from the dust. Okay, now, did everyone see the meat in Luke 16, 1931? Go back, you listen to the argument, ignore the distractions of the devil, and pray God will give me the grace to be more patient and ignore them so I won't be a distraction, and see how much meat was in that story of Jesus, and how much we learn about the afterlife, and the assurance that it gives us that we will recognize our loved ones when we die. If I die now and enter heaven, I will recognize my mother, my father, my relatives, Paul, Peter, 
marry and see Jesus. Okay, sure. Sheol is now the place where the spirits of unbelievers are sent to be tormented. Gehenna is the place where their spirits, spirits and bodies together will be tormented. Their spirits and bodies together will be tormented. Where their spirits and bodies together will be tormented. Okay, let me repeat it again. Repeat it again. Let's repeat this again. You're not. I'm not a sinner. Okay. Let's try this again. Okay. Let's try this again. Are you ready now? Are you ready? Sheol, Hades, is the place where the spirits of unbelievers are sent. Gehenna is the place where the souls and bodies of unbelievers are tormented. Let me show you. From Matthew 10 28. Matthew 10 28. Matthew 10 28. I got to finish up. Matthew 10 28. Someone posted. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Notice body and soul in hell. Now, because of the English translation, all right, let's do this. Come on, man. Because of the English translation, you're going to think it's the same word in the Greek. It's not. Go to blueletterbible.org or biblehub.com, okay? Blueletterbible.org or biblehub.com. In Matthew 10, 28, where it says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. <clears throat> The word hell here in the Greek is Gehenna. Gehenna. The word hell in Luke 16, <clears throat> is Hades, Hades. They're not the same Greek word. Are you with me there? They're not the same Greek word. Are you with me there? Matthew 10, 28, where Jesus says soul and body, body and soul will be sent to hell. The Greek word is Gehenna. In Luke 16, 23, where the rich man found himself in torment as a disembodied soul because his soul had left his body. The word there is Hades, Sheol, Hades. Okay, so let me repeat again. Sheol, Hades, is the place where the souls, spirits of unbelievers are sent to be tormented. Gehenna is the place where the souls and bodies of unbelievers will be sent to be tormented after the resurrection and after the day of judgment. Is everyone there? You get it? Sam Sophie. If God has blessed you financially and you're not using it for the glory of God to advance Christ's kingdom, to take care of the poor, the widow, the needy, take care of ministers and Bible teachers, but you're hoarding it, then your money is your God. You're in sin. You better repent or you'll be punished. Everyone got it now? The difference between Gehenna and Sheol slash Hades. Everyone got it now? You got it, rational phobia. You got it. You got it. I'll do a session, Lord Jesus willing, this week. This week, Lord Jesus willing, I'll do a session on the difference between Hades slash Sheol and Gehenna. Hades slash Sheol and Gehenna. I'll do one. But for now, I want you to get it, right? 1028 says, God will send and destroy body and soul in Gehenna. Luke 16, 23, the rich man died. His body went to the dust, but his soul went to Hades, Hades, Sheol. It's a different Greek word. Everyone got it now? So let's end it with Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Let's end it. And thank and praise and glorify, magnify, love the triumph God for this blessing.
blessing us with knowledge, with wisdom, understanding, blessing us with the Bible to know him, blessing us with resources like the internet to proclaim it for the glory of Jesus. Keep glorifying him. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. And let's end it. And I need your prayers, right? And I'll tell you how to pray for me in a minute. Someone's going to post Hebrews 12, 22, 24 for me, right? Anybody or not? I'm going to have to read it. Just let me know. Can you do it, uh, Walid and Nasiri? Come on, brother. Word to your mother. Okay, let's do this. I got to take this off. Sorry about that. All right, come on. It's not coming off. Read with me. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Read. He posted it. But ye are come unto Mount Sion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Guys, you better pay attention. Pay attention. Heavenly Jerusalem. This is in heaven now, right? To an innumerable company of angels. So who live in heavenly Jerusalem? Angels are in heavenly Jerusalem, right? And then 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. They're even having church in heavenly Jerusalem. In heaven, in heavenly Jerusalem, the Jerusalem that's above, they're having church. They have church in heaven. Pay attention. The church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all. So who's in heavenly Jerusalem? The Jerusalem above? Heaven? God is there, the Father. Angels are there. Church is there. And then notice this. The spirits of just men made perfect. Guys, please read Hebrews 12, 23. The spirits of just men made perfect. Wow. Spirits of men, not their bodies. Yeah, because their bodies went to the dust, but they're there as spirits. Their spirits are now in heavenly Jerusalem, in heaven, beholding God the Father, the angels, and, in verse 24, Jesus Christ. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, meaning that's the place where he presents his sacrifice for our salvation. That speaketh better things than that of Abel. So what else do you want than Hebrews 12, 22 to 24, where you're told the spirits of men who are now just, who are now perfect, their spirits, not their bodies, are in heavenly Jerusalem, Jerusalem above, where God is dwelling with angels, with the Son, Jesus Christ, and they're having church. You caught it? Did you catch it? Yes, right now, J.C. Denton. Is God in heaven right now? Yes. Are angels in heaven right now? This is talking about right now until the end of the age, until Jesus returns. God the Father is in heaven, called heavenly Jerusalem. The angels are there with him. Jesus is there in his physical glorified body, presenting his sacrifice for our salvation before the Father as he sits on the throne. And the spirits of just men, spirits of human believers, who are now perfected, who have died and their bodies returned to the dust, their spirits are there beholding God the Father, beholding Jesus Christ, fellowshipping with angels and one another. Okay. Pray for our sister Michaela Terrell for her back. So I hope this blessed you. Go back, re-listen to it. Learn the arguments. Wherever I'm wrong, ask the Spirit to convict me and correct me, not to repeat those mistakes. Where I'm right, absorb it, share it, proclaim it for the glory of Triumph God, and let the Bible bless you and comfort you. Physical death is not the end of us. Physical death for a believer is a transition where our spirits leave our bodies, enter heavenly Jerusalem, and our spirits have a shape and form of some kind by which we continue to recognize one another. And as we recognize one another in that place, there's no more sin, no more gossip, no more hate, no more, no more lust, but perfect, uninterrupted fellowship and love with one another as we behold God the Father visibly and Jesus Christ and love and fellowship with them until Christ returns, raises our physical bodies, makes them immortal, and unites our resurrected bodies with our souls so we can live in bodies forever with Jesus on earth. That's the end of the story. Now, pray for me. Pray for divine favor in Jesus' name. Pray for divine favor. God, give me favor with the locals here. 
with the authorities that they will favor me, bless me, keep me planted here, that I don't leave anytime soon. I stay here for many years in this new state. Pray for abundance of provision to get on my feet, to get my own place, uh, to be able to do ministry for his glory. Pray I get healthier, get holier. Pray he brings my daughters sooner than later to kiss them and love them and affirm them. And pray for that godly partner that God has in mind to reveal it so we can begin doing ministry for the glory of Jesus until Christ takes me home. Love you for the sake of the Lord. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah for the glory of God, to the glory of God the Father and for the glory of God the Father. Amen. Modern author, come Lord Jesus sooner than later. In Jesus' name, Yahovah, Father, Son, Spirit. Say, Christian, we're all going to stand before God in judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, Even believers will stand before Christ in judgment to give an account for how they live to receive either rebuke or a reward. So don't expect any rewards for you, Sai Christian. Just expect discipline, rebuking, and chastening. Okay? Christ is risen, risen indeed. We love you, Lord Jesus. Have mercy on us and forgive us and seal us by your spirit for your glory forever. Take care.